absolutely. Um, well, it's good to have you here. Um, Thank I'm, you. I am in Morganton also. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice and cool up here this evening <laughs> and windy. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Well, Ashlyn, are you ready on that end? And are we recording? We are set to go. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get started. And, and I'm sure um, several will, will continue to join us. But uh, good evening and welcome to the Adult Children of Aging Parents, or ACAP as we like to call it. Um, tonight's program is Driving and Aging. Uh, my name is Bruce McReynolds and I'm the chapter coordinator of the Adult Children of Aging Parents chapter here in Guilford County. Um, ACAP, Guilford County is one of uh, several chapters who make up the national ACAP community. And I, I think we have uh, some folks here from some of the other chapters. So I'd um, say welcome and we're glad to have you with us. And if you're here as a first time guest, um, welcome as well. So our programs are from our nationally validated and copyrighted curriculum, um, local community experts, um, one of which you'll see here this evening present each of our programs. Our chapter is led by over 21 industry experts um, who select and validate the materials that's being presented. So um, our ACAP Guilford County programs are presented monthly. Um, we meet here um, via Zoom and Facebook Live um, the third Thursday of each month at seven o'clock. So if this is your first time with us, um, we would certainly invite you to tune back in um, each third Thursday at seven o'clock. Um, some of our topics coming up in the next couple of months. Um, in February, we'll talk about anxiety, depression, and aging, and that'll be presented on February 18th. In March, our topic will be nutrition and aging, and um, that will be presented on March 18th. So if you'd like to be notified of our upcoming programs, you can email us at acapgilfordcounty at gmail.com uh, to get on our mailing list. If you signed up with us this evening via the uh, email invite, then um, we have your information and we'll be happy to um, invite you during each of our upcoming programs. You can also take advantage of our expert-led content on our podcast library. Um, this can be found at acapcommunity.org. So um, if you um, benefit from what you hear this evening, uh, check us out at our ACAP community and, and uh, listen in to some of our um, podcast. Well, in order to bring you the programming, we have some um, wonderful sponsors that have um, stepped up to help fund all of our efforts throughout the year. So we'd like to recognize um, Griswold Home Care, Providence Place, and Mount Zion Baptist Church for their support throughout the year. Tonight's program is brought to you by uh, Haynes Lineberry Funeral Services. So we appreciate all the folks at Haynes Lineberry and um, for, their, um, for helping support our program this evening. Haynes Lineberry Funeral Services are dedicated to helping you celebrate your life or that of a loved one with a funeral or memorial service befitting the life lived. As part of the Dignity Memorial Network, Haynes Lineberry Funeral Services will ensure that you receive the value you deserve from North America's largest network of funeral, cremation, and cemetery um, service providers. Our services include 100% guarantee, a national transferable, transferability, bereavement travel services, child and grandchild protection, 24 hour uh, compassion helpline, and other programs designed to help, help you with a myriad of questions and issues that arise when death occurs. Haynes Lineberry Funeral Services are also there for you to um, Plantation or cemetery services in advance. Planning ahead is a responsible, caring act that can reduce stress for your grieving loved ones. It's easy to understand how making decisions now about your final arrangements can help assure those left behind um, know your wishes and are being honored. So um, thanks again for everyone at Haynes Lineberry. 
Um, just a note, if you have any questions throughout the program tonight, um, I'll just draw attention to the chat box that's uh, at the bottom of your page in the middle, you'll see an icon that says chat. Uh, you can go ahead and keep that open. And if you have questions, I uh, would really love to hear from you and um, just type those in there and our presenter will, um, will get to those and address those. Um, so let's jump into our uh, topic this evening. Um, again, the, um, the topic is dr uh, driving and aging. In most communities and for most adults, uh, driving a car means independence, the ability to spend time in the community with friends and family, attend church, shop for necessary items such as groceries and medications, get to medical appointments, and participate in a host of other activities that are necessary for physical and emotional well being. As we age, changes um, in our vision, our hearing, physical functioning and cognition may make drive, driving um, not only more difficult, but perhaps unsafe. Unless parents experience a sudden decline, however, these changes generally occur gradually and may be uh, imperceptible to the aging driver. So every driver is unique and um, age alone is not a good indicator of driving ability. Um, so when should you give up driving? Who makes that evaluation and decision? And what resources may replace driving um, oneself? So with us this evening uh, to help us navigate through all of these questions and issues is, um, is a driving expert. And so uh, we're uh, excited to have with us this, e this evening, uh, Cindy Crompton. Uh, Cindy is president, owner, and lead occupational therapist with Driver Re Re Rehabilitation Services. Um, she uh, attended uh, undergraduate school in North Park College in Chicago and received a degree in mathematics and psychobiology. She obtained a master's degree in occupational therapy from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, she began her career as a therapist in an acute care setting in Honolulu, Hawaii. She then relocate, relocated to Greensboro, where she began driving a driving program at Moses Cone um, Outpatient Rehabilitation Center. Um, she was also with uh, the, a team leader with the outpatient neurology-based therapy team, responsible for program development and personal growth and retention. Cindy started her driver real, uh, rehabilitation services um, an independently owned business in August of 1997. In order to work uh, full-time uh, in the area of uh, driver rehabilitation, she's a licensed occupational therapist, a certified driver rehabilitation specialist, a certified driving instructor, and holds a specialty certifications from the American Occupational Therapy Association. She has a post-professional um, certification in low vision rehabilitation from the University of Alabama. Um, she maintains a membership in the Association of Driver Re Rehabilitation Specialist and is often a presenter at national conferences. So with that, we'd like to uh, welcome Cindy and, and we're glad you're with us and um, I'll turn the time over to, to Cindy Crompton. Hey, great, I'm gonna move to my screen for a second and get it up okay well that sounds way better than like i here's how i think of myself i'm a farmer's daughter daughter from iowa and i have this great profession that i love what i do and that's kind of all the other stuff i guess did happen but um anyway so what we're going to talk about just are some of the challenges that come along with um, aging and driving. And sometimes they come in quick, sometimes they creep in. And um, just talking about how do we navigate those. So here's the other part of my life. When I'm not doing driver rehab, I'm raising these hoodlums that are now entering late high school and early college stages. And then Amber, our Chinese daughter in the middle was um, with us for three years as an international student. She's at Penn State and still is with us when we're doing family vacations and things, and then one at Old Miss in Mississippi and two in high school. So 
that's a little bit of that. And then um, like Bruce already said that I have a private practice in driver rehabilitation. I really see folks all across the lifespan. So from the um, student maybe that's in driver's ed in high school with autism or cerebral palsy or spina bifida that might have some driving needs all the way up through the aging driver. Of course, tonight I'm talking about the challenges that come with the aging driver, but I do have the opportunity to see folks across the lifespan and see some today. I was with a young woman of cerebral palsy who's 35, but I started her process, um, gosh, 15 when she was in her 20s, so about 15 years ago. And just helping her out with some challenges that are coming along in her situation as well. So that to be said, but I'm gonna start and I'm gonna pop off full screen because this is easier to show you just from straight from the browser. We'll start off with a little video. Uh-oh, why'd you go mute? Bruce. A new article adds to the growing conversation about when older drivers should hand over the keys. More than 41 million drivers over the age of 65 are on the roads today. Crash injuries sent more than 290,000 older adults to the emergency room in 2016. Now an article in the New England Journal of Medicine argued retirement from driving threatens one's health and wellness. Vladimir Dutier of our streaming network, TDSN, spoke to older people about the independence that driving represents. Vlad, good morning. Good morning. This is often a touchy subject, but it became an international conversation last month after Britain's 97-year-old Prince Philip caused a wreck when he was behind the wheel. He handed over his keys for good, and as we learned, that's not an easy thing to do. 86-year-old Joan Mastriani has been driving around Albany, New York since the Eisenhower administration when she was in her early 20s. And while she still hits the road with her 89-year-old husband, Anthony, to run simple errands, it worries daughter Kathy and her siblings who wonder if mom should lock the keys away. You don't want to wait till an accident happens in order you know, to make that decision. You want to be able to make that decision on your own. Like we're not going that far, but uh, be able to go to the library and, and to church and to the grocery store is important. I don't think age as a... You can define it as a certain age. I think there are people who are 40 years old that shouldn't be driving. And, and I, you know, and I think that people that, that have good reflexes and all and have alert and vision is good, they can drive when they're 90. But deciding when to give up the keys is a personal matter that experts say should not be taken lightly. When we get a driver's license, it's considered a big part of becoming an adult. So losing your driver's license feels like the opposite of that. You cannot drive where you cannot see. At this class on Long Island, New York, managing your space when you stop. Senior citizens like Lois and Murray Schnipper are brushing up on their skills. You've heard the criticism that some people have of seniors driving past a certain age. What's your reaction when you hear criticism like that? Seniors come in all different sizes and packages and, you know, and abilities. Um, but I don't think we are being trained individually to recognize when we should not be driving. The fact is that the educational course gives them a refresher on the rules of the road. Like stopping for three seconds, checking your shoulder, and keeping their eyes on the road. We sort of warn each other about certain things now. Like I say, well, you shouldn't be talking with your hands when you're driving. Uh, Something like that. <laughs> There's always been in this country a romantic notion of driving, the open road, and the freedom that it represents. Could taking away the keys of someone who's older be, in a way, detrimental to the health of some older people? It's absolutely detrimental, and that's proven. So it decreases people's ability to get to work, to have fulfilling social lives. Older adults who are socially isolated or have huge health risks. It's basically akin to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The Mastrianis don't want to give up driving just yet, but have a backup plan for when they put the car in park for good. When you want to do something, get in the car and go. So, uh, but we have Uber around here and all, so we have to ultimately do that. When I don't feel safe, I, I guess I'll stop. When it's time to talk to a loved one about possibly giving up their keys, here are a few tips. 
check if permanent medical conditions are preventing them from safely driving, such as dementia, have them take a driving test, or enroll them in a driver safety course. For more tips on making the transition, you can head to our website at cbsthismorning.com. And one of the things Lois and Murray told me, it's humiliating when the children that you first gave car keys to <laughs> right. and authorized to road yes. say, mom and dad, yeah, hand, them over. hand them over. It's a difficult conversation because most elderly people still think that they were doing okay on the road, even when they're not. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. They, yeah. Murray, uh, Murray told me driving the speed limit is not a bad thing. <laughs> people say they drive too slow. They're driving the speed limit. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, pop back over here. Okay, so that gives us a little flavor about what we're going to be talking about. And this is a national concern and one that obviously brought you to tonight's meeting to talk about. And what I hope we're going to spend just a few minutes going over some slides on demographics and why is this a rising concern that we're talking about nationally. And then um, at the end, I probably should have this at the last, but we're going to talk about some of the legal implications and concerns. And then I'll talk about what happens in my work, doing a comprehensive driver evaluation and the different mo modes and models of service, and then what some of the challenges of outcomes may impose. But as we talked about, or as that um, video showed, you know, for most of these people, they gained their independence at 16 and they handed their children keys and they watched other people get independent on the road. And so now um, that, driving ability really feels like a right that they should be able to drive and really we think of driving as a privilege but it offers a sense of independence and it's something that they've, that they've had for so long and so tackling the issue of driving safety can feel very um difficult for folks to process and think through and one of the challenges i talk to folks about all the time is if you are in control of that decision just like planning for your own retirement that it's helpful to feel like you have some control in that decision, you have some ability to um, be mindful of that versus feeling like someone's taking it away. So as much as we can, we try to talk about empowering the person to be making those decisions or be a part of that active decision making. And so why the aging driver? Well, seniors account for the fastest growing segment of the driving population. And these are some other statistics, but just growing numbers. And then to put it in chart form, we can see that between 2000 to 2020, there's a 75% increase in those 55 to 64, 54% increase in those over 65, where the age group 35 to 44 actually had a decrease in population. So just knowing that um, the balance of our population in the US Census is changing. And this, so we're past 2020, which that, um, last slide showed. So this is, I put the yellow bar in here just to show where we're at now at 2021. And this is looking at the percentage of change in population. And you can see that even going forward from where we're at today, that we have an increase, um, expected increase in the population of those that are over 60 and the blue line, those are over 65, the red line and those that are over 85. So um, even though there may be a smaller number of those over 85 compared to those 60, there's still, the lines are still going up with both population groups. So what about the driver? Why is that a concern then? Well, because 44 million seniors are gonna hold licenses in 2030. And so as the population is increasing, those number of people that are having um, license is also increasing with that as compared to in the past. And we also know that 19% um, of all traffic fatalities involved an aging driver that was killed. And so let's just look at like, what are the kind of percentages of ages that hold licenses? And so if you look at, you know, I think this is kind of interesting, the 16 to 19 year old group compared to in the past, I mean, I remember as soon as I turned 16, I was getting my license and my dad picked me up from school and we went and got it, you know, got me out and all that good stuff. Well, now comparatively, that age group is not as eager to get their licenses fast. And so there's not, you know, that's the actually lowest percentage group, 16 to 19. In the 70 to 84 percent or group is at 84 percent. So just kind of taking both ends of the spectrum, even the 85 and older, the percentage of those in that age group is higher 
um, for those holding licenses 85 and older compared to the 16 to 19 year olds. So we know that you know those 16 to 19 year olds have a higher crash rate is seen. This is looking at crash rates per mile driven. So on this side of the chart, you can see that these um, younger drivers, because of their novice skill level, are having more crashes. But they're so that's the black line. But if you compare to the blue line, the blue line is how many of those crashes are fatal. So you can see that comparatively, even though the young ones are having more crashes, the fatality risk is higher for our aging group. And so there's you know, some obvious reasons for that is that there's more um, fragility as we age. Um, and so that can lead to the higher risk of death when there is a crash. Now I think this one's kind of interesting because this is where there's like, oh, here's a, here's a good one. This is some hope in here. So, Related to the fatal crashes, there is a decline. And so these are ages 70 and older that um, compared to in around 1995, 97 was sort of the peak of when there were more fatalities in the age group of 70 and older. And we see that that is declining some. And they're attributing that in part to the fact that um, we have better safety technology in vehicles. So when there is a crash, that there's less likely to be a fatality because of some of the safety features. And then hopefully also because um, there has been a national push to help educate and keep people on the road as long as possible, as safe as possible. So the primary causes of traffic crashes though, this is important to think about that 90% of those are due to driver error. And so, you know, on our young drivers, that might be their lack of experience or poor judgment. Um, but we also know that as folks age, there are changes that are typ typically inevitable, not always, but that those can create and lead to causes of the traffic crashes. And so what do we do to help prevent those? And these are the common crashes for our older drivers. So left turns, changing lanes or merging, rear end collisions in novel situations such as roundabouts. So research shows that these are the areas where most of the aging driver um, crashes occur. And we know that driving is important and there's many benefits to driving. So there's contribution to our society, our income, our economics, people are out buying things. There's like the um, first video said, that not driving or being told you can no longer drive is akin to smoking 15, I think she said, cigarettes a day, but just the negative health impact that it has when people aren't interacting in their society and contributing to their society. And so we want those aging drivers to be on the road as long as possible, as safe as possible. And that's really the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has made that one of their main goals. And I've been involved in several aging driver research projects aimed particularly at how do we keep our seniors driving as safe as um, possible for as long as we can. And just to think about, you know, some of the things, there's so many things that have changed with driving. So over the years, you know, the vehicle has changed. And we talked about that with just the fatality risk as technology has gotten better, that there are ways that that's enhancing driver safety. There's a lot of research right now being done on um, some of the automated vehicles and will they enhance the ability to keep our seniors interacting in the society and going out more often and what are their fears and overcoming the use of some of those technologies and is that you know going to be a realistic goal and then our roadways are just so different so if we look at you know multi lanes multiple merging high speed traffic um, things that are are maybe more challenging in terms of when a person learned to drive. So the critical nature of looking for hazards over your blind spot may not have been a skill that was that critical when these drivers were beginning to get their license. And now the environments demand that type of surveillance. And we've talked about cars already some. And then just the skills, and I think Bruce mentioned a lot of these in the um, introduction, but you know, the vision and the movement, the memory concentration. And I'm not going to read all these because I'm going to talk about this as we move into this a little bit more. So what are the things that we ask folks that are just healthy, well-aging people to do to increase their 
skills and remain vigilant for their driving. So one of the research projects I was involved in was looking at the impact of exercise. And we looked at sedentary aging folks who then were enrolled in an exercise program. And there was some positive effect of their driving skills compared to pre-exercise versus post-exercise and their ability to make safe decisions and have better reaction time and some of those things behind the wheel. So keeping, you know, exercise, engage in activities that stimulate the brain. And that's one where I tell my aging folks a lot, you know, you might be involved in a crossword puzzle or you like to do things, but put some pressure behind that. So put a timer to it and try to beat your last score or just do it as quickly as you can, because when you're driving, you don't have the opportunity to stop and think about a decision that you need to make. You need to be able to make that decision quickly and interact appropriately with other roadway users. And then review of medications. You know, is there a medication that maybe makes you a little drowsy that could be taken at night instead of in the morning? And planning trips around those times that you feel best. And then of course, having eyes checked. So these are just for all of us really at any age, simple, smart things that we can be doing to um, in turn enhance our driving performance. And then there's other things um, that are more regulation of behavior, like driving when it's daylight or good weather conditions, familiar routes, well-lit streets. You know, some of those um, challenging roundabouts that beca can become a learned and easy um, environment to handle if you understand the flow of traffic. But if it's the first time you've encountered that, especially those dual lane roundabouts, I think they're tricky but knowing which lane to come in and which lane to exit out of and how to navigate that successfully um, can be learned, a learned skill that's really a behavioral change if you're getting educated and learning that environment. And then space is our friend. So always have a space bubble around the vehicle. So you know that that um, ability, if, if somebody throws on their brakes, so there's something unexpected that happens, there's been some extra time built in to react to that. And then don't fight with your spouse in the car, you know, distractions, um, things that can enhance emotion and get you distracted or things that we wanna try to avoid. And then um, always thinking about alternatives as well. So I think it's a challenge just to think if I couldn't drive, how would I get to where I'm going today? And I think about that myself sometimes too, just to be challenged with developing a mindset of independence without necessarily having it be my own vehicle. Um, so, but what if there's still concern? What if there's bigger issues going on? Maybe memory impairment or more of a challenge with movement and vision. Um, sometimes, you know, we see our diabetic folks that have had a loss of a limb that are now trying to determine if they can drive with only one leg or maybe no legs and we need to equip them with adaptive equipment. So in those cases, a driver evaluation may be recommended. And that's really where someone like myself comes in to help determine is a person fit to drive or not fit to drive. And looking at how that medical um, fitness pertains to driving safety. And so where do those referrals come from? And they, a lot of different places. So sometimes it's a physician who recommends it. Sometimes a family is saying, we really want you to step in here and help us. I actually have somebody on my calendar coming up next week who that's the situation as the family said is the children, we can't agree on this issue and we've agreed, but we have agreed to let you determine it. And so they've sort of all stepped back from having their own opinion. And so let's get a, this evaluation and see. And then sometimes law enforcement has um, cited a person for unsafe driving or been at a crash site, or there's some reason that the law enforcement, um, and sometimes it's an aging driver and sometimes DMV. So I'm gonna show you a video of just some of my, um, well, some of these groups of people talking a little bit about this as well. Dr. Keith Willis, okay. correct. I mean, oftentimes there's a discrepancy with the patient tells you, what the family tells you, and it creates strife between the, the family members. And having a driving evaluation helps uh, uh, the physician get a more objective view of what they're actually capable of doing on the road. It helps you uh, officially make a recommendation to the patient whether they should or should not be driving. So I'm Dr. Carmen Dolmeyer. I'm a neurologist here in Guilford, Maryland. 
it helps to have a, a more objective uh, set of data to make a decision such as a driving restriction or even no driving at all, mm -hmm. that it has not to be the family or the family member that uh, appears to be policing. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the doctor-patient relationship, it is nicer to have you know, an objective set of data and say, you have to look at this and you have to understand that you could not just harm yourself, but you can harm others. Two major issues that I see, one is the patients with memory loss, who almost never say that they uh, feel like they shouldn't drive. It's usually someone else that brings them into the office and is concerned about the abilities to drive. I can refer them because I feel like the, the question can be answered better with an objective evaluation. The other issue is the patients who have motor skill problems. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot of times with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Many times their difficulties are not so much memory as their motor skill problems. I found uh, they have a lot of difficulty using their hands and their feet and the hand and eye coordination. And uh, usually I can pretty much convince them not to drive. It's a place you have the memory loss that I have no difficulty with. Mm -hmm. The Department of Motor Vehicles said that you needed to have a stun today. Yes, How come? The only thing I can only thing I, I believe is because I was coming from, from Pinehurst and the stoplight down there. And when the light turned green, I pulled off. So I looked to my right, and here come this car down that little road. That car was running so fast. And I said, I said, this car's I looked, so I looked where I'm going. So the trooper said, did you stop? I said, no, I kept going. But I couldn't get away from She slammed right into me. During that time, the other day, I, I uh, uh, am in great hopes that the uh, uh, You'll be able to notify uh, the DMV side that uh, competent to drive a uh, motor vehicle in the state of North Carolina. Well, because I'm having my birthday next month and I'm a senior, senior citizen, I just wanted to be sure that I knew that I, you know, I was uh, competent to drive. How old are you turning? 90. 90. So good for you. And you're living alone and getting about life fine. So good for you that you're being proactive and really addressing issues that typically need to be addressed as you get older. So. And because I don't know, I can't check my own reflexes and things like that. And I wanted to have a test of some kind, driver's test. And I told my doctor that I was going to ask when I got my license renewed, which is next month, if they would give me a driver's test. And he said, oh, you can have that done. Okay. Okay, so that just gives you a flavor of sort of where um, referrals come from. And there are different types of ways that um, are considered, I guess, driver evaluations with the community. And one would be more like what you saw in that first video, where it's a um, ARP or AAA is doing a driver improvement course. It's usually offered through driving school and is more community based. And then the second one is more of a medically based assessment and education referral. And that's typically what happens at the doctor's office, sometimes a social worker, and sometimes a um, driver rehab specialist who is not or yeah, they're not necessarily specialists, but work in the field of driving like a regular driver in school or an occupational therapist. And then where my category would fall in is the last one where we're specialized doing only really this field of practice. So looking at evaluations and training, um, usually a certified driver rehab specialist, someone who has taken a national certification test, and some of the other certifications Bruce has already talked about, but just that this is the main area of practice that we're in. And this talks a little bit about who are driver rehab specialists and 80% of us are occupational therapists with certification. And then our American Occupational Therapy Association also has certification and they tend to focus more on aging driver issues and where the um, Association of Driver Rehab Specialists is more across the lifespan. But there are different programs and practices in our area that have um, some more comprehensive and some that are doing clinical evaluations only. And most of those are, I think everything on here is hospital-based except for myself. So I'm kind of a, 
unusual situation and where this is what I wanted to be doing full time. And so this is really how I spend my days. And I want to talk a little bit about when someone comes to me, what constitutes a, what I would consider a good driver evaluation. And this is based on national guidelines that have been set forth, but it's a, both a clinical assessment and a behind the wheel assessment. And the reason I think both of these are very important is because you can jump in a car with somebody, but if you don't understand why an error is occurring, you don't know if it's a correctable error. So if someone is um, having problems with lane maintenance, is that difficulty in strength because they're having a hard time holding their arms up or holding onto the wheel correctly? Is it a visual deficit? Is it an attention issue? You know, really the clinical assessment helps identify where are strengths and challenges as they relate to driver safety? And then do we see those same strengths and challenges come out when the actual task of driving is performed? So I personally don't think it's fair to, especially to tell someone that they can no longer be a driver without actually letting them have the opportunity to be behind the wheel and to be assessed um, driving the vehicle. And this person is gonna tell us a little bit about why she opted for a driver eval. I had asked you um, what you hope to accomplish during our time together today. I just want to be verified that I am fit to be on the road. I don't want to take my grandchildren in the car and put them at risk. I mean, I don't want to put anybody at risk, but obviously grandchildren have a special place in your heart. But um, the thought that I might cause an accident or hurt somebody, if this evaluation shows that I am not capable of driving, I'm not fit for driving, so be it. But I also know that my daughter could possibly be the one to say, mom, you can't drive, and then take the keys away. And that makes for a bad relationship with her. I don't want to put that on my daughter. I want an objective person saying, we've checked you out and we've noticed that this, this, and this is wrong. And therefore we can correct these or we cannot correct these. But whatever the outcome is, I'll know that I've done the best thing. So that's mm -hmm. what's most important to me. Mm -hmm. In terms of your disability, what are the symptoms and things you've been struggling with? I've been struggling with upper body strength issues, trying to turn the car. You know, you normally where you could pull out was easier. And you, know, you just pull out and swing back out into traffic or straight. An accident's an accident, I know, but if I could have prevented it, it would have been it would have been the more responsible thing to do. It's going, it keeps like this, and like if I'm driving, and especially heaven forbid I try to reach over and do something, then it's even worse. It's very scary. I can pay medications for tremors, but those medications are going to compromise my body anyway. So that's not always the solution. So it's kind of a catch-22 thing. And um, so I've just decided that I'm going to find out once and for all. The thought of losing my car keys is about the scariest thing I can think of because I always joke with everybody that Heavenly Father picks somebody who's a control nut and then gives them a disease they can't control. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm blessed that I have a support system, but for those who don't, that really would be overwhelmingly sad. So um, we'll figure this out and do whatever is best. And, and certainly I hope I can drive, but if I can't drive, well then I'll stay at home and they'll bring the kids to me to spend the night. Okay, I think she does a nice job of really talking about kind of all of the issues that are at hand. So the effects of the medication and the challenges with the tremors and the support group that she has with her family and she ended up not being a safe driver. And so I was, she, and she received the news well because she was ready for it. She knew what the challenges at hand were for her. So this is a little bit of an insight into some of the clinical assessments that are done. I want to use you up just for the comfort of home, you know, just to make it easier on both of us. Make you more comfortable, me more comfortable. It just works out great. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Your physical skills mean your strength, your movement, your coordination. 
then I'm going to look at your vision just because 90% of anybody's decisions in Heavy Wheel are based on visual input. And I'm going to do a few little brain teaser questions with you because you're making particularly fast decisions when you're driving. And then we'll go and take a ride in my vehicle and determine what controls are best for you. And we'll talk about recommendations. Straight, good. Arms out to the side. Touch your shoulders or fingers to your thumb. monsters just shift in your eyes as quickly as you can. Perfect. Keep your eyes here and turn your head side to side. Good. Now I want you to keep your eyes here. I'm going to bring the pen from alongside of you. When you see it out of your side vision, I want you to tell me. Oh, don't cheat. Keep your eyes here. Yeah. You're wearing your glasses and you're 20 40 with your left eye, which is good. Both of your scores and that other test that we did that looked at gray on gray would tell us that your night vision has decreased, which is normal with aging. And at 91, very normal, okay? So not unexpected, but you need to stay in daylight driving situations. Um, Correct. Okay, so 79 seconds. Okay, so in the moderate to severe impairment range. The number and the letter. So you begin with one and you draw a line to the A. Okay. One A, two B. B. Take me a picture. Okay, then you have to put, did you finish the directions? Did you read all 10, the directions? 10 to 11. Okay, so you got to finish that. Did you do that? Here's the 10 and the 11. I do the same wrong thing every time. Okay. Um, so a little picture of the of you know what we're looking at in terms of physical challenges, strength, reaction time, balance, getting in and out of the car, sensation. Can they feel the pedals? Um, this lady was really unique because she had a loss of all four limbs from a spider bite, um, brown recluse. And so she you know, the challenge of trying to get her driving safely where there was impaired sensation on all four limbs and getting her going. And then here we're looking at, you know, reaction time. Individuals with peripheral neuropathy often have come to, too often come to me saying, well, I thought I was doing okay until I thought I was hitting the brake and my foot slipped off and I ran through an intersection and caused a crash. So these are the folks who really can't feel where their feet are on the pedal. Um, and we need to get them switched over to hand controls in order to be safe. And this is just saying that, you know, individuals that are falling or having more difficulty with walking, climbing stairs are also found to have more difficulty with driving. So that's just kind of one of those signs to watch if your, you know, parent is having a lot of falls and or you know, can't climb up the stairs, that there has been research that has looked at some correlation between that. And that might be a warning sign to address or look at the issue of driving a little bit more. And then neck mobility, because the aging driver is one of their first areas of crashes is a backing up accident. So, well, I just, you know, I just hit the bush or, well, you know, nobody ever parks there in my driveway, but this day they did. And so I hit them. So it's those, there's typically a, little warning sign of some bump ups. You can walk behind the bumper of the car and look for scratches and dents because this is a sign that there's some difficulty that usually occurs in the backing task. And then the other thing is just how does someone fit in the car? So as we age, a lot of times our eyesight or our you know posture changes, which puts our eyesight lower. And so this is a simple solution that can help, but a wedge cushion is beneficial. And the reason we like to look at the wedge is because it puts the eye height higher at the back of your seated position, but keeps the eye height, or I'm sorry, keeps the knee height under the wheel okay. So, you know, comparatively, the first picture without the wedge, the second 
picture with it. So, you know, she's much seen much higher over the steering wheel, but we also want the knees to fit under the wheel. So if we put a big cushion under everything, it changes the relationship of the feet to the pedals and the knees to the steering wheel. And so we want it to just be at that backside to enhance eye um, ellipse out of the vehicle. And then sometimes, you know, using adaptive equipment. So this is a video of a aging driver who had um, prosthetic limb of the lower extremity and needed to drive with hand controls. And there's lots of different types of adaptive equipment. I'm not really gonna dive into all of that today, but that is another reason for a comprehensive evaluation is to figure out what equipment is best for someone. And then are they capable of using that equipment? I had one lady who really wanted to drive with hand controls and she was struggling significantly to learn to control the vehicle. And we would go see her. And I, every time had a conversation with her, listen, I don't want you to spend your money on something that may not lead you to where you want to be. And I'm seeing concerns and I have concerns. And at the end of the day, she ended up not driving. And she said, that was the best money I spent because I have the question answered. And I don't feel comfortable switching to this. And I'm now ready to accept and move to a different um, way of being transported. All right, so here we are, first time out with hand controls, and you are 70, and you have lost both legs. Because of my aneurysm, the particles from my blood clogged my toes, I couldn't get circulation to them, and can green, and they had to remove them. Okay, so that was not quite a year ago. So you've been without wheels for nine months or so. Yeah. How does this and feel? And before that, I always had a car. I'm actually gonna. I'm looking. I just looked at the clock. So we're tight on time because I'm finished at eight, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm as. So you get the idea. You get the flavor of that person. You saw a little <laughs> pinch of him drive with the hand controls. So. Um, we're going to talk about vision is also an area that we're looking at. And this is the research that I've been the most involved in and really kind of my specialty love is dealing with people with visual deficits. And they're hard to tweak out because you can't see through somebody else's eyes. You can tell if someone's having a hard time reaching or if their strength isn't quite good enough. But when there's a visual impairment, it's much harder um, to identify, but also Tell really your hopes are rewarding. time together today. Oh, I know how to teach you how to drive a pilot car. It changed my way of life. You know, my way of life right now, but I have a car. It kind of limits the things I can do, you know, by dating, getting out. So what's going on with you that you're not driving? Why are you seeing me? My well, eyesight, yeah. Oh, I don't have a visual vision in my left eye. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the part, and and I want to see can I drive with one of that. Hopefully, I can do that. And you have a retinal tear right. that's severe enough in your left eye. You don't have good right. vision. Right, that's, that's still got gel in my eye. Okay. And, and, and the doctor don't want to take it out, but she's been we might start tearing again in my left eye. And now they want to tell somebody they see a tear starting in my right eye, but they want to see and watch and see what happens. And then, and if that start tearing, then I don't want to think about that part. Okay, so 90% of the decisions we make behind the wheel are based on our vision. This is what I talked about earlier that most of those crashes we identified at the beginning of this talk are related to looking but not seeing or failure to look. So inadequate surveillance. And I see that all the time with individuals as well that are struggling with their driving. And, oh, really quick, if you look at this, hopefully you see the wheel spinning. I'd love to do this one in person, but focus really hard on one black dot. Really, really, really hard. Just put all your effort there and you should see the wheel stop spinning. And I'm going to keep moving quick, but that's because we have two different visual systems that are working simultaneously. Our central vision and our peripheral vision or ambient vision. And with aging, a lot of people become very overly centrally focused. So watching TV, doing a craft project, maybe cooking, 
but not out in space. And that also, I believe, is one of those reasons we're seeing more falls with aging as well. But peripheral vision is essential for safe driving because it's our fast processing system and it detects motion. So the car coming up beside you, the person crossing the street, you know, the hazard that is approaching the vehicle usually is approaching, approaching with motion. And if the person is failing to use their peripheral visual system adequately, that's not gonna be detected. And um, just that vision, as we age, there are changes that are very common that do have big impacts on driving. And each of these has ways that we can help and some that we really need to be careful about. I'm not gonna dive into all that today, but these are the three big or four big ones that we really need to watch for with an aging person. Um, glaucoma, meaning you're losing peripheral vision or side vision, macular degeneration, you're losing central vision or have blind spots in the central vision. Diabetes is sort of Swiss cheese vision where you can have spots of loss all over your visual fields and want to be careful about that. And then cognition, I wanna to get to these really quick um, because you saw some of this, but I wanna show you when, um, here's some aging drivers behind the wheel and then we're gonna do just a quick two more and then I'm gonna move her ahead a little bit because da, 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 this is who I want you to see. I can't stop distracting you a little bit. Good, so you're routing us a little bit to make a more efficient route. Good for you. Speed looks good. Your lane position looks good. You've been checking your mirrors and watching for traffic, which is very, very important. Okay, you're off. Stay on your side. Turn right in this traffic light. There's some people in the middle. Okay, so you saw some good drivers and some not so good drivers. And I want you to just watch this one really quick when we have to give a difficult um, outcome. Oh, no, you're kidding. Ooh, okay, well, my fault, something happened there. Okay, well, that one, if you, if you wanna hang on afterwards, it's pretty impactful of telling people that they can't drive. And I'm sorry, my link is, didn't, stick or whatever, but this one is when we're talking about driving restrictions. Short of a surprise death, you know, which of course nobody wants, but you know, there will be a time when you'll need to stop driving. And so you need to start thinking about that now. It yeah. might be six months from now. It might be five years from now. Well, if I have to stop driving, I don't know work, so I can go to one of these places. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But you know, just today, I'm saying you can drive with the restrictions. <laughs> but there will be a time when you'll need to stop driving. Okay. I know that. And it's just, it's just, it's a hard transition. So I tell people to think about it now it's because it'll it's ease it's the transition. Fine. Yes. Sure. Okay. 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 So, you know, dementia, um, cognitive clients are not usually good training clients. Um, at the end of an evaluation is a comprehensive report that talks about all of the recommendations and where the challenges and benefits are. Quickly, here's the um, cost for an evaluation, depending on most, most of this category falls within the 700 range. Um, 
And it, unfortunately, it's not reimbursable by insurance because they consider driving a privilege and not a medical necessity. And there are um, certain funding sources, mainly independent living for people who are needs eligible that would um, help fund an aging driver evaluation. And then I think I'm going to stop there. This is just, you know, if you want to submit someone for medical review, physicians have immunity, kind of some quick things, quick um, legal words that talk about that immunity and that, uh, that at the end of the day, and it's this one, the burden of proof of fact is upon the applicant or the licensee. So if um, there is question, the person does have the right to appeal it, but they have to also provide the proof that they're safe if there's questions that have been raised. And so driving is one of the most complex tasks we ever engage in. So think and talk about our driving abilities, be a responsible driver, be careful, and get it in a driver evaluation if there's still concern. We know that driving remains a high priority for aging adults and a national safety issue. Both the clinical and behind the wheel lead to a complete and thorough evaluation and always we're balancing safety and independence. And that's my contact information. I sent Bruce um, these slides of this PowerPoint. And so um, he can give you a copy of that as well. And I'll bring us all back on and I can be on as long as we need to, but I wanna be respectful of your time. And I always have more to share than there's time for, even though I thought I tweaked it down and down and down, but. Um, uh, so Cindy, we had one question from Lisa, um, Lisa Terry. She asked, is adaptive um, driving equipment covered under health insurance or is it private pay and is it expensive? Yeah, so most of the time it is, private pay, but if your physician writes a prescription, they will not, um, it's tax free. So income tax free. I've been really close to this camera the whole time, I guess, <laughs> seeing myself now. Um, and it depends on what the equipment is, it's getting installed. So a typical hand control installation is around 2,500. And then if like a left foot gas pedal is usually less than that. And you know, if there's just like a simple steering orthotic device like that, that's kind of in the one to two hundred dollar range. So it really depends on what <clears throat> is being um, put on the vehicle. And then there are mobility rebates that are offered by vehicle uh, manufacturers. So if a person's buying a one year, like a one year or newer vehicle, then the manufacturers like Ford and Chrysler and Honda, and they have a rebate where you get up to between a thousand to two thousand dollars, depending on which manufacturer, towards the adaptive equipment. So there was a uh, interesting comment by Deborah Morgan. Um, <clears throat> Deborah writes, "My dad kept driving even after his license lost his license. It was a very tough time for our family." Any recommendations for folks that uh, have their parents driving well beyond when they should be? Yes, I mean, that's this is a issue that we talk with the medical review board of our state about as well, is that even if a person's license is revoked, that sometimes they'll still continue driving. And we don't know, you know, how many of those folks are out there, but that does become very difficult um, but I also think, you know, what I would choose to do is if the license is removed, have the car removed as well. And if there's a shared car, then that person has to be very careful about where keys are kept because it is a huge legal issue. And I can, I want to tell you a story, but it's eight o'clock. How rigid are you guys on time? We're good. Go ahead. Okay, so one of my very first conferences that just, you know, and jump off if you need to, I won't take offense, I get it. But one of the very first conferences I went to, um, they showed this young, it was told from the perspective of this young girl who was 12, 13, something like that. And she, her father had been called in to the emergency room. He was a physician for a emergency that was coming in. And so he had, was you know kind of hurrying to the hospital and an aging driver ran an intersection and killed him and she said my dad was on the way to save someone's life I get teary every time I tell this story it wasn't even mine and she said my dad was on the way to save someone's life and instead I lost him 
And the family had taken out a several million dollar policy because they knew this person shouldn't be driving. So they protected themselves financially, but that young girl would never have her dad back. And, you know, it is a hard issue, but we are dealing with public safety and with the life of other people on the roadways. And it is hard to tell someone that video I wanna show you, anybody that wants to stay on, is it's really hard to tell someone that they can't drive. But at the end of the day, when it's the right answer, you know it's the right answer. And there's a responsibility in that as well. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for um, sharing all this information with us. Very, very helpful to understand um, the issues and maybe some remedies and some options for um, working with our parents that um, are approaching that that time to, to stop driving. So thank you for being You're with welcome. us. Uh, Cindy Crompton with Driver Rehabilitation Services. Um, please reach out to her if, if you think um, um, you might be approaching that time with your parents. I uh, would also like to thank Haynes Linebury Funeral Services for sponsoring our, our uh, program this evening. We appreciate uh, their support and uh, invite you to reach out to Haynes Linebury Funeral Services. Um, uh, look forward to um, having each of you with us next month. Um, our program will be February 18th at seven o'clock. Uh, the topic is anxiety, depression, and aging. So I uh, look forward to having you uh, with us again next month. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we are uh, streaming live on Facebook. So if you'd like to see a repeat of this, uh, check us out on our Facebook page. You can see the, uh, the presentation there as well. Thanks so much and, and y'all be safe. So can I say one thing, Bruce? I know it looks like Francis said, I highly recommend seeing the video. So if people want to stay on, even if you're not recording, is that, it's like three minutes. Is that yeah. something to do? Is that okay or? Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's not hard to get to it. I just don't know why it didn't attach, but. If you have to jump off, you can visit us on our Facebook page and see the video clip that Cindy will be sharing. Thank you. Okay. And I need to share my screen again, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. See in the cognitive decisions was the area of greatest concern, which is what we saw here as well. And do you can you tell Cindy what happened at the inter, at the end of your intersection when we we're getting ready to turn on this school Southeast School Road? Mm -hmm. No. No, we just stopped. We were there for four minutes with me not keep, you know, running the queue. Right. Is that the same deficits that you scored in the severe impairment range here that we looked at are also severely impaired behind the wheel. So I'm seeing consistency in your impairment, which puts you at too great of a risk to remain the driver. The other thing is we forgot one of our destinations. So, you know, just your memory, and you even told me when we started today, that sometimes you forget where you're going when you're out on a trip. But our goal is, is to maintain your safety and public safety. Because the wrong answer would be waiting till a crash happened. We don't want that. He's, he's so used to going, but he wants to go there. He might have just can't pick up and go. Any questions, Mr. Riley? It's not the news you want to hear. Is it like you find Yeah. Well, it's not something that people, the decision is not something they reach easily. Well, that's why we had all that testing. Yeah, it is a loss. It's a loss to grieve. It's a loss to have to figure out how life works without that license. And, you know, there it's a natural response to feel disappointed, angry, saddened. None of us want to give up that independence. And it comes so long later. 
I thought it was okay. Well, I'm getting on lines one time, two or three times. Mm -hmm. Well, I jotted down some notes, but I just want to say, um, you know, our job is to help you be as safe as possible. And when we were doing some of our testing today, we had a little bit of trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Some of that mental processing. And you have to have that mental processing to be able to drive. No, we'll be here much longer anyway, so. It's fine and dandy. First time you leave, it's gone. I'll be gone. I'm not going anywhere. Let me ask you this. Could you live with yourself if you were driving and you're really, if you're the city, is your brain is not working correctly? Could you live with yourself if you killed somebody's children or killed one of your grandchildren? Could you live with that? It's something that's out of your hands at this point. It's the disease that you have. That's right. It's not you. It has nothing to do with how hard you try or you cannot try hard enough. Mm -hmm. It's to your brain. I'll take care of that and go to work. So heartbreaking. It is so hard to watch that. But again, it's their safety and public safety. And so, you know, I. I hate to end with that because usually I get the guy that, you know, licks his finger and sticks it on my nose is <laughs> a little more comic relief. And so, you know, I hate to end with that, but I do think it's important because those conversations are hard and they're critical to have. And that's why we're often asked to be the ones to deliver that news because they're very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I would rather have people mad at me and love their family because I'm not going home at the end of the day. And you know, they are, and it's important to keep that. And also same with physicians, because people will doctor hop to get the answer they want and, you know, find a doctor that will, doesn't know them that well to get the right answer. So, okay, I'm gonna leave it at that because now we're eight minutes over and I just, I, I'm passionate about this. I love it. I can keep going, but it's bedtime. <laughs> well, Cindy, thank you again. We appreciate you being You're here. You're welcome. Great information. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. That was an excellent presentation. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. We appreciate it.